Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dave Barry and Greg Isles. So hello everybody, I'm Dave, this is Greg, and um, we know this is a writer's conference, and we know that you're here to hear us talk about writing and all the secret writer stuff that writers know and do, it's, so we're going to do that first. Greg, where do you get your ideas? <laughs> Mostly Scottsdale. Okay, that's the writing uh, part of the presentation. Okay. We're, no, we're going to do a little bit of music first. We will get around back to writing if, if you want. But uh, Greg and I are, are uh, both, we're in a band uh, called the Rock Bottom Remainders, which is a literary band. Uh, not a good band, but a literary band <laughs> composed of authors. When everybody's there, the band includes Stephen King, Amy Tan, Mitch Album, Mr. Scott Turow, who's here uh, at the, the conference this year, uh, Ridley Pearson, Roy Blunt Jr., uh, who am I missing? You got Mitch? Yep. Stephen King. Stephen King, I said him first. Thank you, though. Yeah, I, I Jamie, <laughs> Jamie forgot that I already said Stephen King. Is it? And Roger uh, McGuinn from The Birds uh, plays with us most times. So. Roger McGuinn plays with us sometimes, and, and many, uh, some actual musicians have played with us. I mean, we're not a good band. I, I always like to say we play what I call, uh, well, Roy Blunt Jr. described our, our genre as hard listening music. Um, <laughs> And I, I describe our system, I call it the rumor, the rumor system of music, where everybody's holding an instrument and playing something, and then a rumor goes around that there's been a chord change. <laughs> and, and as various members of the band hear the rumor, they go, huh, and then we all switch to different chords, not necessarily the same different chords or at the same time. But so. Um, but we have fun. As Amy Tan once put it, uh, I would do this to kill the whales. Um, so we, we were going to do a couple of songs that we do that are original songs uh, by the Remainders. And the first one is a song I wrote. And actually, I originally wrote it for uh, the Prairie Home Companion. Garrison Keillor had a, uh, had a one of his, one of the, uh, are we still allowed to talk about Garrison Keillor? Yeah. I don't even know anymore. Uh, but he, he had a, a show devoted to um, the, the literary world, and he asked me to write a literary song. So I wrote, wrote this song, um, and, and uh, it's called Proofreading Woman. It's a song about a guy who's in love with a proofreading woman. To do the song, I need the help of two entities. Uh, one is you folks. I'm going to teach you a part that you're supposed to sing. But there's a solo in there that only a woman can perform, and we've invited a woman indeed, and Deb Green, the executive director of this conference. Deb Green, come on stage, please. It was very cute. Earlier, Deb and Greg were comparing prosthetic limbs. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was pretty entertaining, I'll tell you. Um, it kind of made me want to get one, but I don't know what's, what's involved. Anyway, so this, the song is called uh, Proofreading Woman, and here is your, your part is to say the words, I'm in love. Practice that. I'm in love. But enthusiastically. Sound like you're actually in love. <laughs> okay. I got nothing. You got anything? So I'm going to say, what? I got no volume. You got anything? Oh. Are the guitars on? Okay, so when I go, I'm in love, you go, he's in, lo he's in love. I, what did I tell him? I told you wrong. Don't say I'm in love. <laughs> you idiots. Say, say he's in love, okay? I'm going to say I'm in love, okay? So it'll go like this. I'm in love. He's, he's in, in love. love. That's very good for, for people your age. Okay. And he's, he just, actually just plays record, faster than he thinks, so it's more like, I'm in love, he's in love. It's that and, fast. And just for the record, uh, I am your age, okay? <laughs> so I know. Ready? Yeah, man. Two, three, four. Well, some men like a woman with a beautiful body. 
something like a woman with a pretty face. I like a woman with a big vocabulary and every single little comma in place. I'm in love. He's in love with a proofreading woman. I'm gonna love her till the day I die. She's got a big dictionary, real good grammar. She never says between you and I. Go ahead. Why do you think we were on solo, Not yet. man? She fixes up plays, she fixes up novels, she fixes up books full of poetry. She fixes everything that her editor gives her, but my baby saves her very sharpest pencil from me. I'm in love, he's in love, with a proofreading woman. I'm gonna love her till the day I die. She's got a big dictionary, real good grammar. She never says between you and I solo. Handsome man fell in love with my woman. He tried to take her away from me. He said, Hey, baby, I'd like to really know you. She said, Frankly, I'm not attracted to men who split their infinitives. <laughs> Deb Green, ladies and gentlemen. I'm in love, he's in love, with a proofreading woman. I'm gonna love her till the day I die. She's got a big dictionary, real good grammar. She never says, one more time, I'm in love, he's in love, with a proofreading woman. I'm gonna love her till the day I die. She's got a big dictionary, real good grammar. She never says, between you and I, no, no. Never said between you and I. No, no. Never said between you and I. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Thanks, you killed it, lady. Thank you. Oh, do you want to do the? So that's one song. <laughs> the, the other one is a Greg Isles. Will you? What you tell him, Greg? Which? Where are we putting it? Well, when I joined this band. Can we get a little more volume? We're going to rock it a little bit on this. I want to feel it come back. There we go. Um, and I had to sit in. I won't tell that story now. We'll see what we get into later. But the song they gave me was Steamroller Blues, James Taylor. So I, I did that a few times with the band. But then being in this guy's company, you got to get a little crazy. So I rewrote it with a literary bent. And it gets kind of edgy. I've been known to talk about other writers, make fun of other writers. James Patterson comes to mind. <laughs> and uh, I think I've gotten caught on camera doing that before, so I've sort of modified away from that. Now I have friendly verses, like when Stephen King's playing with us, I have a Steve verse. Now, I have an Amy Tan verse that's sort of risque, but I think this crowd's over 21. I'm looking, yeah. I'm thinking. So when Amy plays with us, she, you think of her as this demure almost academic type woman. Amy's role in the band is rhythm dominatrix. She, dre <laughs> she, dr she dresses from head to toe in leather with a bull whip and whips us on the ass while she's singing, these boots are made for walking. So you get a feel for what this, this thing is. So, so the, the, the third verse in this song is when I say the word tan, you'll get it when I get to it. I'm talking about Amy Tan, and usually she's prancing out here in her leather outfit. She, I tried to get Deb to do that, but she, she uh, couldn't, couldn't sell her on that. Okay, so here we go. This is called Big Best Seller Blues, and this is all in irony. Trust me, don't, don't take this seriously, okay? <laughs> Well, I'm a big bestseller, baby. Give me some volume, baby. Shakespeare ain't got squat on me. Yes, I'm a big bestseller, baby. It's all about the royalty. 
write a book a year forever. Then when I die, posthumous me. I'm a big bestseller, baby. William Faulkner's just a bum. I say that as a Mississippian. Yes, I'm a big bestseller, baby. Hollywood gon' give me some. Give me some love, George Clooney. And if you wanna save a million trees, just download me from Amazon. I'm a, oh, well, here we go. Here we go, sorry. I'm a bold, erotic novel. The kind of book they used to ban. The ladies peel back my brown wrapper. And then they read me with one hand. But Fifty Shades of Grey, that's so passe. I've got 100 shades of tan. I'm a big bestseller, baby. I got numbers, I got class. The big best seller, baby. All that rejection's in my past. But what I really want to say here today is all you critics kiss my ass. Right here. Whoa. Whoa. See how lately they. Got myself a bad, bad case of those b -b big bestseller balloons. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Well, that's it. That's what we got. We're done. Uh. We'll see you. <laughs> no, I, I was just going to say, we, we've had a... Um, some pretty uh, interesting experiences over the, over the years playing in the band. What everybody always asks us is, what is Stephen King really like? That's the main question you get. Um, and the truth is, he's a fairly normal human being in a lot of ways. He's very smart, very funny, much likes to joke more than you might think. Uh, his fans are not normal people. <laughs> And I'll give you one example. Uh, we were playing, I think, in Nashville. And we were doing a, uh, a teenage death anthem. Steve likes to do uh, the, the teen, like teen angel. Sometimes he makes up uh, words to them. Um, like, there's a song called Last Kiss. It's kind of a pretty song, country one song, but it's one of like, many songs that involves a car crash and tragedy and, and all. So the, we get to the key moment in the song. We're actually not sounding bad. It's kind of a pretty song. And the, the, you know, the, the crash part and then the sad part, and Stephen sings the following. He sings, when I awoke, she was lying there. I brushed her liver from my hair. That's right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not saying he's completely normal, but I'm, I'm saying his fans are, are much stranger than he is. And, and that, we're, so we're doing this, uh, one, I don't remember what song, somewhere. But Stephen's singing it, and Ridley Pearson, who is our bass player, comes strolling by me and says, check out the woman in front of Stephen. And I look over uh, to Stephen's side of the stage, and he's looking down kind of with a scared look on his face, and a woman right in front of him standing like this, and all ten of her fingernails were on fire. <laughs> Flames coming out of her. Now, I, I like to think those were artificial fingernails. Uh, <laughs> This may, or maybe just something she could do. I don't know. But <laughs> Ridley goes back the other way and goes, I don't ever want to be that famous. Uh, uh, but, but in ordinary, Stephen, Stephen's a regular guy. We, we played also with some uh, pretty well-known uh, performers. 
Uh, Roger McGuinn, as, as, uh, as Greg said, plays with us regularly. The late uh, Warren Zevon used to play with us all the time. Um, uh, probably the biggest name person ever got on stage with us was Bruce Springsteen. Um, wow. we, uh, we were playing in Los Angeles, and I don't really remember the connection. Somehow there was a connection with somebody under band, spouse, and, and his management company or something. But all of a sudden we ended up on the stage uh, with Bruce Springsteen. He came out at the end. And um, we, we don't have a vast repertoire. <laughs> and we had really used them all up, pretty much. <laughs> and so we're down to one song, and the song is Gloria, um, which it's not a complicated song. If you <laughs> pick up a guitar and just throw it down on the ground, it will play Gloria, okay? <laughs> so... I had to say to Bruce Springsteen, Bruce, do you know Gloria? And he, <laughs> and he goes, I think, I think I can handle it. And he did. He, he did fine on it. And we would have invited him in the band, but he has not written a book. So uh, anyway, so who else? We, what else? Well, you see weird things in this band and the weirdest things we can't talk about here. Oh, but, but some of the things you learn about other writers, we were playing the outdoor at UCLA, I think. Some people said it was 20,000 people. I don't know. So here we are, everybody in that band, fairly big name people, and there's a building off to the right, and in the middle of a song, there's a commotion, and there's like eight black SUVs, and the door opens, and out comes this NBA-sized white guy, and these coats are flapping, and it's like the Uzis and the whatever, and I'm like, is the president over there? What's, what's going on? It was Michael Crichton. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Why does Michael Crichton need, like, the Secret Service, okay? <laughs> yeah, you just, you learn. I, some writers like Steve are, like, the humblest guys. I've been in situations with Steve that were dangerous, where he was at risk from fans losing it and being aggressive. But then, you, then there's people on the other end of the spectrum who are just, I'm all that, you know? <laughs> Most writers are not, though. Most writers are the same person they were when they were 12 years old. That's been my experience. <laughs> When we, uh, when we travel with Steven, he, he does immediately, he's like a beetle. He immediately, B-E-A beetle. He just draws, uh, he draws people from all over the place. We, we were once on a bus trip in, on I-95 from going from, uh, I believe, like Philadelphia to Atlanta. And we pulled over at 3 o'clock in the morning at a rest stop somewhere in the, one of the Carolinas. It's literally 3 o'clock in the morning. We stagger out of the bus, and, and we're, we came back to the bus. There were people standing around the bus holding hardcover copies of The Stand. <laughs> like, where did they come from, you know? <laughs> or do they just wait at the rest stop <laughs> on I-95 in case Stephen King... Because <laughs> he does. Every That's, what he does. Like. That's what it's well, like. And one time, we, they were playing at the Miami Book Fair... And I, we had played, and it was fun. And, it, and again, we went out to dinner afterward, and it was late. And, um, and I, was, I was giving Stephen and Amy Tan a ride back to their hotel. And they both needed to go to a drugstore. So it's like around midnight, and there's a 24-hour drugstore near where I live. So we go in there, and Stephen's off getting what he's getting, and Amy's off getting it. And this young couple come in, and the woman keeps looking at Stephen King. He's, you know, like, browsing the, the, the decongestant <laughs> aisle or something, you know. <laughs> And then she comes over to her boyfriend standing near where I'm standing, and she says, I think that's Stephen King over there. And he looks over, and he goes back, and goes, what the fuck would Stephen King be doing here now? And she goes, you're right. And <laughs> out they walk, you know. <laughs> We're telling nothing but Steve stories, but it's, it's just so different. It's. Steve is like being with Bob Dylan or yeah, somebody. Yeah. It's not like being, I've been with big actors that don't generate the reaction. Steve does. So he and I share in common that we nearly died in, in a wreck. And shortly after my wreck, I had torn my aorta, broken like 30 bones, lost a leg. Steve had been through his thing. And we were playing somewhere where the stage was like four blocks through an outdoor mall from the green room. And Steve's like, <laughs> Taking a pain pill, I'm over there taking pain pills. I'm like, it's four blocks to the stage. What are we, what are we doing? You know, there's no cars. And leave it to Dave. He and Ridley Pearson, what do they do? They go find like a, a, a UPS cart, like a thing. <laughs> and they put me and Steve on the cart. 
and they wheel us through this outdoor mall. And since Steve is bored and he will do anything, we start singing songs at the top of our voices like the wreck of the old 97 and some. <laughs> And, and in the instantaneous second people caught sight of him, they're screaming, it's Stephen King! And there's a wave of people following, you know? It's just everything you ever do with the guy becomes a story, you know? Um, one, of the, one of the more, um, I don't know why this reminded me of that, but it, one of the more beloved, uh, now deceased guys who used to play with the band was Frank McCourt, who, who, who always was, uh, and uh, just really funniest man, and um, w one night we, we played, believe it or not, we, were, we played several times at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. fame. We're not in it. <laughs> I keep hoping. I keep but hoping. We, play, we played there for, for several different, different functions, including the opening of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which where we played for the VIP dinner the night before, which was everybody in the audience was a rock star. And it was kind of smart on the part of the sponsors. They said, if we put any, you know, rock star on the stage, it's going to become an awkward thing, everybody. But if we put you guys on the stage, they'll just, they'll just enjoy themselves. So that's, that's who we play for. But anyway, one night, not that night, a different night, we played in, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and Roger McGuinn was with us and Frank McCourt. And afterward, we, we got into somebody's hotel room, and um, we had a, a lot of beer. I remember that. And Roger McGuinn, who is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, got out his guitar, and he and Frank McCourt <coughs> uh, started to sing Irish folk songs, both Irish guys, and they were singing and singing and singing, then suddenly just pounding on the door, and a s big security guy is standing there, and he reams out Roger McGuinn and uh, Frank McCourt for singing too loud in his hotel. He reamed out, a, 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 a literally 100 feet from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, reamed out a guy who's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Anyway, that's my, I don't know why that was uh, reminded me. All right, of I'm, <laughs> I'm telling a Dave story. Dave, is so, he's come here, what, several Thousands times? Thousands of times. Now, a few times. <laughs> so I'm going to give you the inside poop a little bit. Two things I always think about Dave when people ask me about him. These are only semi-humorous, but they're true. One is, you know how we normal humans are when you get into a confrontational situation or an awkward situation? And 10 minutes after it's over, you think of the perfect thing you should have said, <laughs> and you're so mad, and you think about the rest of the day. Dave thinks of it the split second somebody says something wrong okay, but or it's, whatever. What I say is, you asshole. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what, it's not that hard. You could do it. I, I, see, I see him like he keeps himself in check, but I have seen him when he literally took a little bit of umbrage at what somebody said and just cut their throat in a millisecond, and I just think, why can't I do that? Why, <laughs> why not? Now, semi-humorous, we, we get to play cool places in this van, and one place we got to play was Google headquarters, when it was still a cool thing. And uh, so we're sitting in the lobby, but there's work rooms right up by the lobby, and we come in and we're mesmerized by this big board showing every Google search in America, like in real time, and we're just sitting there going, you know, idiots. And, Dave walks into a workroom where there's two, all I'll say is obviously very intelligent guys, and there are all these equations on the board in like red, and I couldn't figure them out if I had 100 years. I mean, it was Google level mathematics, physics, or whatever. So Dave walks in, and he stands there, and they look and they see him, and he stands there like he's reviewing the board for five full <laughs> minutes. This is what he does for kicks. And finally, I'm kind of watching, and he goes, no, 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 no. That's all wrong. <laughs> and they turn around like they're about to have a stroke. And the guy's, the guy's like, what's wrong with it? He goes, it's all the wrong color. <laughs> Sorry. We'll, we'll try to eat, make a slow transition to books. In, but I, I just want to talk quickly about how we ended up, the two of us, in, in, a, in a literary band we both started out in, in, in bands. When I, I went to a college in Pennsylvania called Haverford College. Our, thank you. Our motto is, we never heard of you either. Uh, <laughs> but, oh, my. It's a, <laughs> it's, it's a fine college, and I went there in the 60s, and I really mean I went there in the 60s. And from, I graduated in 1969, and, and I worked my way through college playing in a band, 
Um, we played all over the Philadelphia area. Every Friday, Saturday nights, we, we were playing frat parties, at, you know, UPenn and all over the, the Delaware Valley. But our band was called the Federal Duck. Um, and it was called the Federal Duck because one night we were sitting, Haverford College has a duck pond, and we were sitting by the duck pond, and this line of ducks got out, it came out of the water, came kind of marching right toward us. And our, our bass player, a guy named Bobby Stern, became deeply concerned that the d these ducks we're working for the government. <laughs> um, and if, if you don't know why he might have thought that, then you were not there in the 60s. Um, that's all I have to say about that. But anyway, that was, that's how I got in. I played, I played a lot in, co in college. And, and it, the band was actually, that I was in, was pretty good. I've, I've never been myself good, but they, the band was good. But after that, I, um, when I got out in, into the world, I had nobody to play music with, and it, I was just thrilled back in the 90s when I got together with other artists and we, we could start to play again. This guy, who's totally sandbagged the, uh, the Remainers, um, when he came here, over the, after the Remainers became sort of a thing, a lot of authors would want to join the band. It became cool to join the band. And we wouldn't let them in, because mostly they were good. <laughs> uh, and that's one, one thing we don't stand for in our band, <laughs> is talent. Um, Greg didn't tell us that, that he was good. Greg turns out to be really good guitar player and singer, as you probably noticed. But he played in a band, called, which is the, this is the best college band name I've ever heard. Southern college band name. Tell them the name of your band. The band was called Frankly Scarlet. <laughs> sort of literary. Yeah. So tell them about Frankly Scarlet. Well, uh, very quickly, you know, it, it, these aren't funny stories when you did it for real. So I, I played music for a while for real, whatever that means. But the first year I was married, this is music, uh, I was on the road 50 weeks out of 52. And, it, and I realized, you know, this, this isn't going to work. I'm not going to last long doing this. But the thing about music, and this is why you see so many writers and actors playing, writing books is hell compared to playing music for living. Music is like an infinite, instant dopamine loop where you just walk out there, play your songs, and the love just comes. And the remainders, they're throwing geriatric panties at you, right? <laughs> you just you got it. Writing a book is sitting in a room for a year, two, three, nothing. No feedback. You don't even get a letter till the year after you put the book out and stuff's coming out, or you finish it. And you, you know? can never say to anybody, take it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Solo, man. <laughs> so, you know, get, getting with these guys was just, uh, it's bliss because they have roadies and they have uh, everything you didn't have when you were a musician for real. But I will say, getting along, there's, a, there's a learning curve getting into becoming Dave's friend <laughs> because when I, when I got asked to sit in, I've never told this. I said a little bit today. I was on about my fifth book. In Natchez, Mississippi, I walk outside in my mailbox. I'm flipping through the bills, just bored to death. And I, I see this handwritten envelope, and I open it up. It is a letter, essentially a fan letter from Stephen King. And I just, I just started shaking, you know, because I was just nobody then, you know. And within a little while after that, I get this mysterious invitation from Ridley Pearson to sit in with the band in New York. But for some reason, Dave thinks I'm a bass player, if not a guitar player. And so Ridley tells me the song, and I go listen to Chuck Berry or whatever it was, and I, I, I learn it. And then I get there, and we just have like two seconds of rehearsal. This band flies in from all points of the compass, rehearses like two hours, and then we go on tour or whatever, right? So I walk out there. I'm playing it completely wrong in rehearsal. It's awful. It takes me just a second to pick it up, but... As far as Dave's no, Dave knows, I just suck, right? So we're at the pre-show pre thing, and Dave goes, how long have you been playing gr bass, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> and, and from then on, probably for two, three gigs, he just, he just stick the needle in, stick the needle <laughs> in. And finally, you know, I had to just be a good sport and kick some ass up there. I finally got in. But woo, man. Yeah. He's a hard audience, I'm telling you. Okay, so now what do you want us to talk about? <laughs> No, we, we can talk about it. Well, let's we'll ask questions. Let's take, yeah. yeah. Do you tell us what you want us to talk about? Because we're doing it. The, the way they have this writer's conference set up is every author here is in conversation with every author here at least six times. <laughs> at breakfast, we just sit there in silence because we don't. <laughs> you don't want to waste any of your material. Yeah, you other, can't do it. You know? But, 
Who, who books our gigs? I like the way you use musical terminology like that. Gig. <laughs> we have sharps and flats in our courts. Uh, now, we, we have a, um, we, we don't really, we have a guy, we call him our manager, Ted Hopti Gabber, who, who cons various large uh, literary related agencies into funding us. We, we raise money. We don't ever take money. Um, nobody would pay us anyway, <laughs> except maybe to stop, you know, but uh, we raise money for literacy. We, we've raised quite a bit of money for literacy over the year, I think. Yeah. We're for literacy. I personally am against literacy. It does not help the sale of my books at all, but <laughs> most of the people in this band are pro-literacy, and, and um, so we, we, it's kind of, a lot of people will say, hey, we'd love to have you, and I say, well, look, you've got to fly in the band, a sound guy, you know, um, you know, do you really want to do rent all the equipment? It's like, in, and it's usually a big, complicated thing. So we are actually going to, am I allowed to say the name of another book festival? Yeah. Mr. Jamie Cow, the stable genius behind the, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right, right. Well, never mind stable, but anyway. <laughs> but um, we're, we're going to play at the Tucson Festival of Books um, in, a, in a couple months. But I, we haven't played in a while. This so. booking is a very frustrating process. I'm going I'm to get Dave again here. A, they've turned down play in the White House, okay? We missed that gig. And then next I hear, Ted tells me, hey, man, you guys got asked to play the Amazon corporate party with Bob Dylan and Nora Jones. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm in. Let's do it. And then I hear Dave and Mitch got to do some two-man thing over in Ireland or something, so we can't play. That's the way the booking works in this band. I'm sticking the needle in now. Thank you. But as Dave yeah, said, we'd have never met It's hard Dylan. to get everybody together. And it's like <laughs> Greg says, there are bands, we understand, who practice the songs ahead of time <laughs> and then play them as they practice. What we do is we play the songs and then go, jeez, we should practice these songs <laughs> sometime. But well, we, we never really get a chance to, you know. So, yes, sir. When are you coming out with your new first album? When are we coming out with our first album? <laughs> not, not while any of us are still alive. That's, <laughs> we, no, we, we have learned, um, you know, there are a lot of amateur bands like us. Um, Every town you go to, uh, there are, and, and, and for a while everybody thought this was very original, but there'll be a group of lawyers, a group of dentists, a group of whatever, and we all, they all wanted to be musicians and they never were, and then they became wealthy and they could afford to buy unbelievable equipment, and equipment now you can buy, you can, anybody can sound pretty good if you don't know anything. Um, so that every, every city has these bands. In fact, I once, I live in Miami, and I, I was asked to MC a battle of the bands, and it was like accountant bands and, you know. <laughs> and I had all this material. And, I, like, I get up and I go, by day, they're accountants, lawyers, dentists. Tonight, you're going to find out why they're accountants, lawyers, you know. <laughs> I, I thought it was hilarious. And meanwhile, they're backstage tying on headbands and, you know. <laughs> and they think they're really good. And they're not really good. And that's one thing we know. We know we're not really good. Some of us have actually been in pretty good bands, so we know the difference. We know not to record, and if anybody tries to record us, we have them killed. There's an, <laughs> there's an invisible line that you can't, can't cross, and you've got to know where it is, and Dave keeps us there, but I'll never forget Roy Blunt. We were on some California tour. We're rehearsing, and somebody's interviewing us from a magazine, and Roy's off. He always, he's very quiet, and then he comes out with the driest, funniest thing, and he's sitting over there watching, and he just goes, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> he goes, we got too good. <laughs> you you got to keep, you got to not take yourself seriously. Well, I, Bruce, Bruce, when Bruce Springsteen played with the band, afterward we couldn't leave because the word got out and so like, there's a big mob outside and the police had to come to get ready to go home. So we're all stuck in a room with Bruce Springsteen, which was fun, but we, you know, we had like a while. And finally at some point somebody said, so what do you think of the band? He goes, God, aren't bad, but don't get any better. You'll be just another shitty band. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, we have tried to live by those. Uh, by by those the way, I do, I do want to say, Dave sort of had a rule. I was told this when I got in the band. You can talk about anything on the bus except writing, right? <laughs> Which didn't make any sense to me. To me, the cool part was being in a band with Stephen King and Scott Turow. And, and so we get off to the side, and we're... Scott and I are talking about first-person, present voice or whatever, but you feel like you're hiding from the teacher, you know, <laughs> to talk about anything real. Well, so. Shout it out. Yep. Dave decided to bring Paul Oliver. Does he have a band? 
<laughs> okay, okay, wait a second. I'm answering that. Okay. <laughs> we, we played the EMP in Seattle. Oh, do we have any desire, any to, play desire to play with Paul Allen? Wow. So we, we play the EMP in Seattle, and they tell us Paul Allen may be sitting in with us. We don't know. Like, we're supposed to get ready for that, but we don't know. But the first thing that happens, this is life with Dave Barry. We get to the building, the big whoever designed the thing, I don't know. Okay, and Frank and, and, and Dave stand there, and he goes, and he knocks on it a minute, he goes, I'm pretty sure we can take this thing down with a couple of Phillips head screwdrivers. <laughs> That's true, though. It, the whole thing is held together with screws. It's a little terrifying. And, and the rest of the night was pretty much like that, and Paul chose not to <laughs> bless us with his presence there. Well, we've stumped Wow, it. <laughs> okay. I guess we've got to talk about literature. Okay, we'll have to talk about books now. I think we're supposed to talk about presidents. That's the thing, I think. No, can we not? No? Okay. Sorry, go ahead. You take it, man. Miami, Natchez. Well, I, yeah, okay, Th that's all right. We're both sort of connected to the cities in which we write. I live in Miami. My joke is I moved there in 1986 from the United States. Uh, <laughs> I could say the same thing since I'm from almost the Confederacy still, really. Is, so. But, you know. but I, I write a lot about, I mean, I, pretty much everything I write has something to do with Florida, Miami, um, because it's... You know, if you're a humorist, it's a target-rich environment. <laughs> Although lately, Hawaii's been giving us a run for our money. <laughs> um, what did they say? With the, uh, yeah, they, I don't know, did you, the, did you see the computer menu yes. that the guy used to launch, to announce that there was a <laughs> missile coming in? And like, basically it was like, press one to indicate a missile is coming to Hawaii, press two to order Papa John's. <laughs> it was like... <laughs> And then, and then my favorite thing, though, this just came out, I think, yesterday. The governor revealed that the re <laughs> he knew within two minutes that it was a false alarm, but he was unable to inform the citizens of Hawaii. And this is what he said. This is not the onion, and I'm not making this up. He, he didn't know his Twitter password. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that is absolutely true. He wanted it, which was probably, for the record, password, you know. But he, 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 wanted to, he wanted to tweet out that it was a false alarm, but he couldn't because he didn't. And I thought, man, that, that's like Florida-level stupid, you know. <laughs> We're going to have to step our game up to beat, to beat that. But anyway... I, look, I can't follow this. I'm, I'm, it, it's odd for me because, I mean, I'm whatever a serious novelist is, that's what I am. So it's like... That's okay. You can be... To go from, you know, I have this personality with them, but then I go off in my corner and write about racism or the Holocaust or sex abuse or whatever. So it's hard to, you know, mix the punchlines. Well, I that. got a question for you because I've, I've been to Greg's house and been to your town. He, Greg is kind of like a, a big deal in Natchez. Um, that's pretty easy. Well... <laughs> <laughs> but you write, uh, you know, there's a lot of you in your, your books, a lot of connections, and, and I know with every novelist, they get tired of being told that, you know, every character has to be something you, th you know. Yeah. Novelists are, like, always saying basically the same thing, we make things up. Don't, you know, just don't assume that everything I write is me. But you live in a town where everybody knows you. You write uh, novels in, set in that area with a lot of characteristics that are connected to you. How does that, you know, how, do people come up to you and what happens? Yeah, I mean, first I would say any writer that tells you they're not writing about themselves is lying. <laughs> or I just they, said that. Or I mean. they, don't know, they don't know they're lying and they're even in worse shape and they need help. So if you're like me and you live in a small town and you, you don't wait for enough people to die before you start writing, <laughs> you're always walking that line of civil action. But... This, is, this story typifies the experience. In one of my books called The Quiet Game, I sort of very loosely, let's say, based a very, very evil character who was a judge on a guy I happened to know who was a judge who was sort of a big deal, and that just ended up being a Mississippi Supreme Court justice. This guy in the book, he was reprehensible. And I thought, well, I'm hiding it enough, you know? And then, but then as publication day got close, I'm like, oh, man, I feel a lawsuit coming. This is scaring me, right? So the book's been out like two days. The phone starts ringing. 
and friends are saying, man, is that, is that judge so-and-so? Is that, is that who that's supposed to be? Hell no. No. God, no. Then what I hear three weeks later is that this judge is traveling around Mississippi bragging that this, <laughs> that this reprehensible character is him. That's the world that we live in now. It's like any fame is great. Just give it to me, you know? But, but do you, I mean, like, do people act like, oh, we, I, I know who you are, Greg Isles. I know oh, I yeah, yeah, that, all the time. But here, here's the saving grace. Whatever you do in a book like that, and people in the town you're in, sometimes they make good guesses as to who characters are. It's a blood sport in Mississippi around where we are to pick the characters in my book. But the good thing is I can go to Savannah or any other small town, and people there are convinced the same character is some person in their town because these archetypal a-holes and whatever else, they're in every town, okay? And they're the same. There's no variation. We're depressingly similar in all our foibles, okay? We're out of material, man. totally. <laughs> Look, Gloria, looks like Gloria. Throw that guitar on the floor. Huh? She wants to play. We don't know, we don't know any more songs. I think well, we're going to get into rights issues I, if we start playing covers. I, okay, I, I wrote one song. I'll do a little of it. This song was called, this is called the Tupperware Blues. You want to help me with Give the me a key. What key? You I don't know. <laughs> oh, you man. Try, let's try G. Okay, I wrote this song. Um, when I was a, a, a newspaper person in Westchester, Pennsylvania, the Daily Local News, which was a little paper. How little, you ask? <laughs> we once ran a headline on the front page that said, Woman Beats Off Would-Be Rapist. <laughs> I'm not making that up. <laughs> and uh, So anyway, there were two... Two guys uh, at the Daily Local News, two, two, two reporters, named Art and Dave, who decided that it would be fun to have a Tupperware party. And I don't know why. Again, it's hard to explain these things. But we had a Tupperware party, and it was like a raucous Tupperware party. M many things were being consumed. And, and, it was, and then the Tupperware lady showed up at the door <laughs> with her samples and stuff. And... And she was like, immediately wanted to leave. And we go, no, 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 this really is a Tupperware party. We wrote a song about Tupperware, because I had written this, this song. Uh, and um, the, and it was a, the song was a huge hit, huge hit. Um, everybody bought Tupperware. Um, <laughs> single guys who had nothing in their refrigerator except, like, transmission fluid <laughs> were buying deviled egg transporters from this woman. She sold, <laughs> she sold a shitload of Tupperware. So years later, I wrote a column about this, um, and I got a call from Tupperware company saying, we're having a big sales conference and at the uh, Tupperware headquarters. Um, would you, you, we want you to come and sing the song. So this, I was at the Miami Herald at the time, and, and I got some guys, and we went up, and we, we formed a, a horrible band, but we played the Tupperware Blues in, in front of 2,000 uh, Tupperware distributors, <laughs> and who were, we got a standing ovation. Um, <laughs> So also, they also gave a standing ovation to a set of ovenware. So I'm not. <laughs> they're like they're like ovation people, the Tupperware. <laughs> but I'll just do do one verse because I don't know that I remember the whole song. But this is the Tupperware Blues. It's, it's you know, what are you? In? No, I, you don't know. G. What did what did I say before? You said you didn't know. No, you don't get it. Let's do G. Some folks use wax paper. Some folks use a Reynolds wrap. Some folks use a plastic baggie to try to cover up the gap. You can use most anything. Keep your goodies from the air. But nothing works as well as that good old Tupperware. Cause it's here. Take a look at what we got. If you don't try some and buy some, yeah. Don't blame me when your turnips rot. I don't remember that. That's it? Yeah. Come but on. The big finale is, all right, because it's here, and we need it, yes, we do. Now going to the five. And I hope that when I die, 
Tupperware makes caskets too. Thank you. Tupperware Blues. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Yeah.